wanted you all to meet Brittany Stafford today. If you've ever joined the live chat, been prayed with, or connected with others online here, then you have Brittany to thank. She has been serving faithfully as our online host team lead for the past two years. As a matter of fact, let's say thank you to her in the chat right now. Now, Britt, what has this community been like for you over the past two years? So this online community has been such a blessing over the last two years. Not only have we been able to serve our community here in RDU, but Summit Online has let us tangibly serve our brothers and sisters in Christ all over the world as well. Yeah. We've been able to sing with, pray for, and fellowship with people who we may not have been able to come in contact with before this platform was possible. Yeah, for sure. And Britt has done an incredible job building a team from the ground up and making the live chat possible. So shout out to our team. But she just transitioned to a full-time role here at the Summit Church with our guest services team. I mean, just as she made our chat feel welcome and create a safe space to belong, she's going to continue to do that for us at our campuses. So I figured there was no better way to commission her into this new role than to have you, our online family, pray with me as we send her out. So let's pray for Britt now. Lord, we just thank you so much for your people. We thank you for Brittany and the way that she has faithfully served this online community for the past two years. Lord, we know that you have equipped her for every good work and that you are gonna to continue to bless her as she moves into this new role with guest services. We pray that you would just show her your favor and peace and um, allow her work to be fruitful. Lord, we pray that you would just bless her for the time that she's been with us um, and that she would just feel encouraged as she go, goes on to her new role here at the Summit Church. Lord, we love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you so much, Summit family. And don't worry, the chat isn't going away. We have a great team who's ready and available to serve and pray with you during the live services. Speaking of guest services, I wanna welcome those of you who are joining us for the first time. We are so glad that you're here and we'd love to get to know you. So pull out your phone and text the word welcome to 33933. Fill out some info and someone from our team is gonna be in touch with you to help you take your next steps here at Summit. Awesome, or maybe this isn't your first time, but you have someone in your life who would be encouraged by today's sermon. We're continuing in our series, Goodness in the Middle. So today is a great day to share this service with a friend. Copy this link and text it to a friend now. Well, who's ready for today's service? Yes. Let's join our Capitol Hills campus team now. Good morning, Summit family. It's good to see you all one more time in the house of the Lord. How many excited to have made it one more time? Now listen, that'd be good for me. I, I would be very, I'd be thankful for that. But how many glad to be in the house of the Lord one more time? Yeah. Well, listen, it's always good to see you all. And even some of the familiar faces that are familiar to me or, no, y'all, I'm familiar to y'all, but I might not be, I might not know who y'all are. No. Hey, family, good to see you all. Listen, I want to do something a little different. Y'all know I like to bring something way back and bring it back into time. So I want to do something a little old school. Can I do something a little old school this morning? But y'all got to promise y'all sing along with me. Is that all right? Y'all probably going to sing along with me? Come on, do me a favor. All over the room. Clap your hands like this. Declaring the word of the Lord. Oh, yeah. These are the days of your servant Moses. Righteousness being restored. Yes, yeah. and these are the days of great trials. Of the famine and darkness and the sword. Yes, yeah. still we are the voice in the desert. Days 
of Elijah, yes, Lord, preparing the word of the Lord, oh, yeah. And these are the days of your servant, Moses, righteousness being restored. What's the next part? Let me hear you say it. These are the... Yes, you are here. Oh, this morning Summit Church. Welcome. Thank you for coming to worship with us. As we continue to worship, we're going to celebrate some baptisms this morning. That's right. Yes. 
We want you to celebrate with us. We want you to stand and shout and praise and thank God for all that he's done in these lives. You guys, this is an outward declaration of an inward change. And as I've had my six-year-old memorize, it's that I'm telling the world, they're telling the world, saying, I have decided to follow Jesus. This is not what saves you though. Getting baptized, there's nothing special about this water. They're just saying, I am gonna be buried with Christ and then rising again with Christ in new life, declaring the world that they are now a follower of Jesus. Yeah, that's a lot to celebrate. So while we sing, celebrate with us, they're gonna be asking them two questions. We say, the first one is, do you promise to go wherever God tells you to go and do whatever he tells you to do? And then we ask and we say, do you believe that Jesus has done everything necessary for your salvation? So as we are praising God and celebrating with them, let's keep singing, let's keep worshiping and thanking God for all that he's done in these lives. Let's sing.
good, but just call his name. Then. Jesus, Jesus. That's our declaration this morning. If any other words, just say his name. Jesus, Jesus. Come on, you got to go down in his name. You come up in his name. And say Jesus. Jesus, Jesus. The only name that can save you, the only name that can heal you, say Jesus. Jesus, Jesus. You might be going through something this week and you might not have said his name all week. Say it this week. Say, Jesus. Jesus. Yeah, the name above all names. Say Jesus. Jesus, Jesus. Yeah, the only name that can save you, Jesus. Say Jesus, Jesus. Hey, the only name that can heal you. Say His name again, Jesus. Jesus. Come on, lift it up even louder, church, from your heart. Cry His name out, Jesus. Jesus. At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, every tongue will bow. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Summit family. Good morning, Summit family. Good morning. I don't know about y'all, but I needed to be reminded this morning that Jesus, his name makes the darkness tremble. His name is the light that the shadows can't deny. Amen. Amen. My name is Antonisha and I'm on staff here at the Capitol Hills campus. We're going to continue our worship this morning by the giving of our tithes and offering. If you're a guest here with us this morning, we don't want you to feel compelled to give. Actually, we have a gift for you. If on your way out, you stop at the first time guest tent, you can uh, receive a gift there from us. But if you would like to give, you can text the word give to 33933. Or if you brought your gift with you, you can place it in the buckets in the back. Or you can always give online at summitchurch.com. Summit family, you can go ahead and be seated. We're going to continue in our series that we've been in over the past couple weeks, Goodness in the Middle. We can see God's goodness in the past. We can see God's goodness in the future. But what about now, here, in the middle? Most of our Bible was written by people waiting on the goodness of God to break in. Most of our lives are lived there too. What would it look like if we trusted God, not just in the past, not just in the future, but trusted his goodness in the middle. Well, good morning, everybody at all of our campus locations here in the Triangle of the Summit Church. We are in the middle of a series from Psalm 23, and we have one more official message in this series, but I'm actually going to do a bonus message this weekend showing how in our suffering, God often wants to use us in the lives of others. I'm doing this because this is what we call Compassion Sunday. It's a week that we observe every so often here at the Summit Church to highlight a ministry that we love working with called Compassion International. Compassion International does um, holistic child development with vulnerable children in some of the poorest communities in the world. And by holistic, I mean um, spiritual, physical, 
social, educational, professional, medical, the whole package. I've been to visit several of their locales around the world. They are amazing. Compassion helps establish an educational, medical, community development center right in the middle of one of these impoverished areas, right alongside a gospel preaching church. That's an essential part um, of their strategy. The partnership strategy for us as the Summit Church is very simple. Individual members in our church will adopt a child in need. And that means committing to make a small monthly donation, about $38 a month, and uh, send an occasional note of encouragement as you want to. It is so easy. I love it. Every four minutes, a compassion child somewhere gets saved. Today, you can become part of that. Um, each of my kids, my four kids, Karis, Ali, Raya, and Adden, have sponsored a child in the Dominican Republic. It's been a great way for me and Veronica to introduce our kids to the needs of the world and to personalize it for them. Um, over the years, they've exchanged letters with um, these children there, and we've even traveled down there a few times to see them. Um, if you're looking, parents, for a way to get your kids involved with missions and to awaken them to global realities at an early age, this is it. For others of us, uh, young professionals, older singles, senior adults, for example, sponsoring a kid allows you to play the role of uh, like a big brother, big sister in a kid's life um, for less than you probably spend on coffee at Starbucks every month. This is a low investment, high impact ministry. And so at the end of today's message, I'm gonna give you an opportunity to explore sponsoring a child. And in case you're wondering, by the way, in case the cynical part of you kicks in here, um, we do not get anything back from this as a church. We don't make commission and compassion does not give us one dime. We just believe in this organization and we um, believe in what they're doing around the world. Now, here's how this week relates to our series right now. Goodness in the middle. When we find ourselves in a place of waiting, and we all do from time to time, the one thing, the one thing we can always be sure that we should be doing is ministering to others. David, in his time of wilderness, in his time of trial, when he was walking through the valley of the shadow of death, he said, we saw this last weekend, my cup overflows. And we saw that that meant that in a time of trial, God fills us up with himself so much that it just overflows to others. Remember our, our sponge we had on stage last week? God is so powerful, so in control, so joy giving, so overflowing in love that if you are soaking in him and feasting at his table, then when life squeezes you, even when it's unfair, what comes out of you is his grace. In fact, I'll show you this today. One of God's primary purposes for sending suffering in our lives is to, to bring salvation to the world. The melody line of the entire Bible is that through God's suffering servants, he brings redemption to the nations. That happened ultimately in Jesus, of course, but it's a, it's a pattern that's set down in the Old Testament. It's repeated over and over and over again until all these stories in the Old Testament create a silhouette that Jesus and the Gospel of Matthew just kind of steps into. And we're all like, oh, there you are. We've been hearing about you now for several thousand years. When God's servants go through an unfair trial, when life squeezes them, what comes out of them is God's grace. And through that, others are gonna learn the truth about God. They get to taste in it. So today we're gonna see that principle play out in the story of a young girl who suffered unfairly. A girl whose name we don't even know. She found herself in a terrible situation. But because of her trust in God through it, God used it to bring healing to a bunch of people around her. What I'm gonna suggest is that for many of you, what God wants from you in your time of waiting is he wants you. You're like, what do I do? I don't know what to do right now. It's when he wants you to start ministering to others. And while there are multiple ways that we can apply this, I'm gonna suggest that a great way to do that today this through Compassion International. It's not the only way, but I'm gonna give you that as an, op uh, an option. In fact, write this down as we begin. Here's your, sort of your thesis statement for this, this morning. Serving is always the proactive posture of the Christian life. Serving is always the proactive posture of the Christian life. When you don't know what to do, you just serve. Take a Kings 5 if you got your Bible, okay? Yeah, you can actually just, I mean, stay in Psalm 23 if you want, but let's spend most of our time in 2 Kings 5. I'd encourage you to turn there. Today, you're actually gonna hear about two suffering people. One was a believer and the other was not. And their sufferings, you're gonna see, are intricately intertwined. In fact, the believer in this story suffers precisely so the unbeliever can escape from his. The unbeliever is a man named Naaman, and he has a terminal disease, leprosy. 
The believer is a 14 year old girl who was kidnapped. Her parents were murdered and then she was trafficked. She is a victim in every sense of the word. But today you're gonna see how God turned her suffering awful as it was into something beautiful. I remember as a kid, there was this painting show that would come on PBS on Saturday morning after all the good cartoons were over. It's the kind of thing you'd watch when you'd totally given up on your day, when you just knew it was gonna be a, a sweatpants and Crocs kind of day. You know what I'm talking about? It was called the Bob Ross Painting Show. Anybody remember that? All right, Bob, the painter, would paint these pictures. And as he went along, he'd explain what he was doing. He'd say, he'd paint these trees, be like, oh, happy little trees, happy trees. Remember that? And he'd always start his pictures by slapping these amorphous blobs of color onto the canvas. And you'd think, what is that? But then somehow through like a couple of quick strokes, he would make it into a beautiful cloud. Like so good that you think that could be a photograph of a cloud. And then he'd say, oh, happy little clouds, happy little clouds. And then I think, how did he turn that amorphous blob of paint into a cloud with just a couple of strokes? Well, in a way, that's what you're gonna see God do in this story. You've got these things that feel like amorphous blobs of chaos that God just adds a couple of strokes to and they instantly transform into works of art. 2 Kings 5, y'all, this is one of my favorite stories in the, in the entire Old Testament. I'm, I'm serious. I love it more than the story of David and Goliath. I love it more than Daniel on the lion's den. I even love it more than left-handed Ehud sticking a knife into the fat king's belly or Jael driving a spike through Sisera's temple. I love it. And here's the thing. If you did not grow up in church, you've probably never heard this story. So you are in, you are in for a total treat. Verse one, 2 Kings 5, Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Syria was a mighty man and in high favor with the king because by him, the Lord had given victory to Syria. Now, wait a second, victory over whom? Well, Syria's enemy was Israel. Naaman was the captain of the forces that had conquered Israel. God had promised Israel that if they wandered from him, that he would send in enemy armies to punish them and Syria was one of those armies. And Naaman was the captain of that army. He, Naaman, was a mighty man of valor, but, this is a huge but, he was a leper. At the time, leprosy was the most feared disease in the world. It started as a small, white, powdery spot on your skin, like like a rash that would soon spread all over your body. Wherever it spread, the nerve endings in your skin died and boils would break out, leaving these gaping wounds of raw flesh. Eventually, body parts decayed and fell off. Your facial features lost shape. You became grotesque. In those days, there was no cure. Leprosy had a 100% death rate. And to make matters worse, it was regarded as highly contagious. So the moment one of these spots was discovered on you, it didn't matter who you were, you were immediately banished where you would spend the next 10 to 20 years in isolation as you slowly corroded and died. Now, we can cure it pretty easily now with modern medicine. Sadly, there are still tens of thousands of people with leprosy in South Asia and Africa, but back then there was no cure. So here you got the mighty Naaman, a man on top of the world who discovers one of these spots of death on him. And in just a matter of a moment, he goes from being on top of the world to the pit of despair. Verse two, now the Syrians on one of their raids had carried off a little girl from the land of Israel. And she worked in the service of Naaman's wife. Here's our second character in the story, the Israelite servant girl. Verse three, she said to her mistress, would that my Lord Naaman were with the prophet who was in Samaria. Samaria at that point was still part of Israel. And she's talking specifically about Elisha, who's one of the greatest prophets in Israel's history. He, she says, he could cure him of his leprosy. So Naaman went in and told his Lord, the king of Syria, thus and so spoke this girl from the land of Israel. And the king of Syria said, well then go now and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So he went taking with him taking with him 10 talents of silver, 6,000 shekels of gold, and 10 changes of clothing. Now, y'all, that would have been a ginormous sum of money. In our terms, it's like 750 pounds of silver and 150 pounds of gold. Clothing might seem like an odd addition to that massive amount. Here's $5 million and some shirts, um, but, but don't think like jeans and a t-shirt. This is like a whole formal party get up. Super expensive. Uh, Most people back then would never even own a single set of clothes like that. So to have 10 pairs would today like uh, being having a garage full of Maseratis or something. The point is the man of God gonna be blinging after this moment, okay? Verse six, and he brought, 
And he brought the letter to the king of Israel. And the letter said, when this letter reaches you, know that I've sent to you Naaman, my servant, that you may cure him of his leprosy. And when the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes and he said, am I God that I could kill and make alive that this man, the king of Syria, sends word to me to cure a man of his leprosy? You know what he's doing? See how he is seeking a quarrel with me. In other words, in other words, in other words, this king of Syria is looking for an excuse to go to war with me. And so after I fail to heal Naaman, the king of Syria is gonna say, well, I asked you to heal my servant and you didn't. So now I'm gonna bring my armies and destroy you. It's a pretext for war. Verse eight, but when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, he said to the king and he says, why have you torn your clothes? Let, let this man now come to me. Send Naaman to me that he may know that there is a prophet in Israel. Elisha recognizes a bigger purpose in Naaman's leprosy. He knows that God is wanting to do something in Naaman's life and to all of Syria, he wants to show them that the Lord is God. Verse nine, so Naaman came with his horses and his chariots and he stood at the door of Elisha's house. Y'all imagine what this would have looked like, a mighty cavalcade of horses and chariots. Today, think of it like an entourage of police cars and suburban suddenly driving right up to my front door, helicopters flying overhead. Verse 10, I love this. And Elisha sent a messenger to him saying, just go wash in the, in the Jordan seven times and your flesh shall be restored and you shall be clean. Y'all catch that? Elisha doesn't even go out to see him. He sends an intern. There's one thing that I've learned here over the years and that is important people do not like to talk to interns. Um, I read that Steve Jobs got really upset with President Obama when after Apple released the first iPad, Obama had Rahm Emanuel, his chief of staff, call Jobs to congratulate him instead of doing it himself. And Steve Jobs was super ticked off about it, super hurt. Here you got the most powerful man in the world coming to the home of a relatively unknown prophet and the prophet won't even come to the door. He sends a messenger. By the way, how would you have liked to have been the intern who had to deliver that message? I'm sorry, General Naaman, brother Elisha has a busy afternoon and he is not gonna be able to see you today. Meanwhile, Naaman can look inside and see Elisha kick back in a recliner with his feet up, you know, watching the Bob Ross painting show or whatever, okay? Here's a question. What do you think, what do you think God's doing here? Let's keep reading, verse 11. But Naaman was angry and he went away and he said, behold, I thought he would surely come out to me and stand and call upon the name of the Lord his God, wave his hand over the place and cure the leper. I thought he would like, there'd be a ceremony. Elisha would run out of a smoke-filled tunnel and jets would fly over. Beyonce would sing. Elisha would walk on some hot coals, charm some snakes, and then I'd be healed. Furthermore, verse 12, are not Abana and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could not wash in one of them and be clean? We got rivers in Syria and they're better than this piddly little Jordan River. One day, I hope we can all take a summit trip to Israel, but, but if you go to Israel sometime, what you will see is that the Jordan River is not that impressive. It's more like a slightly oversized creek than anything. Mostly shallow, muddy, plus it would have been another 15 miles past Elisha's house, which would have meant a couple more travel days on horseback for Naaman. So he turned and went away in a rage. He's insulted probably plotting revenge. But his servants came near and they said to him, by the way, it's amazing how many times in the story, God speaks to Naaman through not important people, but servants, That's a, there's a point there. And they said to him, my father, if it was a great word that the prophet had spoken to you, would you not have done it? Hadn't he only said to you, wash and be clean? Again, it's amazing, this is coming through servants. This whole process, this whole event is designed to bring Naaman to a point of humility. The whole thing is a lesson in humility. True conversion always is. These servants say, Master, if Elisha had, had told you to do something difficult, if he told you to get the berries off of a plant at the top of Mount Everest or to clip the toenails off of a dragon, wouldn't you have done that? Look, man, all he told you is go and wash. Man, what do you got to lose? Go try it. A little swing by the Jordan on the way home. And if it doesn't work, you can come back and do your big bad general thing to Elisha or whatever. Verse 14, so he went down and he dipped himself seven times in the Jordan, according to the word of the man of God. And on the seventh dip, his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child and he was clean. In other words, he did the first time, nothing, nothing happened. Second time, third time, fourth time, 
Naaman getting angrier and angrier each time. He can feel the mockery of his servants. He can feel the scorn at how pathetic he now looks. You know that he's sitting there thinking, what am, what am I even doing? I'm the most powerful man in the world and I'm humiliating myself by putting myself underwater seven times in this nasty little river of a country that we've conquered. What am I doing? Everybody thinks I've lost my mind, but he's desperate. He's desperate and on that seventh time, as he comes up out of the water, he looks and the leprosy is gone. He's got skin, it says, like a, like a baby skin. And so he returned to the man of God he and all of his company, and he came and stood before him. And he said, now watch this, keep in mind, this is his and Elisha's first meeting. Up until now, Naaman's only talked to, to, a, to the interns. So here's the question. What would you say to the man who had healed you of a terminal disease the first time you met him? You'd probably say something like, you saved my life, I'm healed. Look at what Naaman says, verse 15. Behold, I know that there is no God in all the earth, but in Israel. Friends, he does not say the first thing about leprosy. He never even mentions it. He only talks about God. Naaman had not been looking for God. He'd been looking for a cure for leprosy. But God used his search for a cure to lead him to something even greater than the cure itself and that is a relationship with God himself. And the knowledge of God that he found was so valuable that when he finally met Elisha for the first time, he forgot even to mention the healing. All he talked about was God. If you go into your boss's office to request this Friday off, and the boss says, well, sure, but while you're here, I just got done meeting with our board. You did a great job last year, and we're gonna give you a $200,000 bonus. When you get home that night and your wife or your husband says, how was work today? I doubt you'll even bring up that you were able to get Friday off. <laughs> See, that's what happened to Naaman. He found something better than a healing for leprosy. He found the Lord. So I wanna use this story to make two points. Number one, God uses your pain to bring you to him. Here is the question that Naaman's story ought to make you ask. What if God was trying to send you a message in your pain? I'm not saying that this is true for everybody that's in pain right now, but it is a question that some of us should at least ask. You see, up until this moment, Naaman, up until the moment that Naaman discovered this spot on him, he had felt on top of the world. The story says he was on the king's arm, which means he was the king's right-hand man. It says he was highly regarded, which meant he was a, a celebrity. Everybody in Syria loved him. People were always asking to take selfies. He was a national hero, he was trending on Twitter, whatever. All that was taken away in a moment by one small spot. One small spot brought the mighty name and crashing to the ground. One small spot showed him how fragile everything else was. What if God was doing something similar in your pain? Again, I'm not saying for sure that that is what is happening. But what if that problem had been put there by God to wake you up to a bigger problem? And that is the problem that you're not right with God and you don't know him. I know a lot of athletes that point to a debilitating injury as the thing that finally woke them up to the really important things in life. I once met a professional athlete a few years ago who, who had just signed a multi-million dollar contract to play in the pros. But then he got into an accident doing something dumb that totally destroyed his future career. This guy did not know God. His career was his God. He told me with tears in his eyes, I lay there on the ground, my legs broken, saying to myself, I can't believe I threw away my entire career for a few foolish seconds of fun. And I said to him, I said, respectfully, man, I think God may have been doing something way bigger in your life. I think he might've been trying to say to you, you're throwing away your entire eternity for a few seconds of glory in an athletic arena. Make a long story short, God ended up using this tragedy as he does with many people to bring this man to Christ. So what if God in your pain had something for you beyond, something even better than the cure that you seek? And what if this thing that God had for you was so valuable that after you found God, like Naaman, you find yourself failing even to mention the healing 
So great is the treasure you now have in God. So again, I ask, has God revealed a spot in your life that tells you that you're not as together as you, as you thought? Maybe that spot is a, is a wrinkle in your marriage. I sit with powerful men and women sometimes who can speak and command things that work and their power is amazing, but their marriage is falling apart and they don't know anything they can do about it. Maybe it's a problem with your kids and you feel helpless. That's maybe where I see this the most. You're worried about your kids or maybe, maybe your kids are wandering. Maybe you got no more relationship with them and you keep asking, how did we get here? Maybe it's a habit that you can't break this morning. Alcoholism has somehow snuck up on you. And you're like, I don't know how, I don't even know how to start talking about this. Pornography, a bad temper. Maybe it's a personal failure that you, you're humiliated by. Maybe it's just a dull, aching unhappiness that you just can't get rid of. Maybe it's this inability to figure things out. You feel paralyzed, unsure of what way you're supposed to go. A health scare. In a sense, all of us have that same spot. It's our mortality. We are all going to die. Your body has an expiration date on it. It's like we're all walking around with a stick of dynamite in our hand with no idea how long the fuse is. Could be a week, could be 70 years, but at some point you will die. Even with all of our advances in modern medicine, the death rate is holding steady at 100%. See, these spots can all wake you up to a bigger problem. That is where you stand with God, the God who created all of us. You see, leprosy throughout the Bible symbolizes sin. Like leprosy, sin deadens. Like leprosy, it grows in you and corrupts you over time. Because of it, you slowly begin to lose feeling in parts of your life, parts of you die. Your innocence dies, your joy dies, your optimism, your compassion for others. In many ways, you become grotesque spiritually. Scripture says the penalty, the wages, the result of sin is death. Our souls have a spot of sin on them that is, the, that is corroding us from the inside out. And sometimes these lesser spots, the problems in our lives can wake us up to the ultimate spot that we should be worried about. I haven't told this story in a while, I think, but before I became pastor here, I worked on a landscaping crew, okay? So when you got me as pastor, you got somebody highly qualified, right? The, this foreman on our crew was, a, was this giant of a man. Now, I, I never even knew his real name. I only called him Ivan because he looked just like Ivan Drago from Rocky IV. He was tall, about six, eight, he was blonde, he was mean. He cussed all the time. One day as we pulled up to a job, he was, started cussing and he let out. I don't know what, was, what kind of mood he was in that day but he just let us string cuss words. I mean, it was kind of like a work of art. I was like, I don't, that was impressive. Um, but it included <laughs> several phrases that just blaspheme God's name. And I, yo, I don't know what got into me. Actually, I do know. I got filled up with the Holy Spirit. And I said, Ivan, you need to watch your mouth because one day you're gonna stand before God and you're gonna give an account for all that you have said. And trust me, man, when you stand there, you don't wanna have all that blasphemy of God's name on your account. And then y'all, the Holy Spirit totally left me. <laughs> Just me. Looking at the 6A guy. So I, I turned and walked off stage. I heard these big footsteps coming up behind me. He, he got right in front of me and, and he said, do you... In fact, I remember it was one of the oddest moments. Never would have anticipated this. I look up at him and he's got this look in his eye. He looks mad, but he's also, there's something. He said, do you really think? He, wait, back to the first thing he said was, say that again. So this time I said it a lot less eloquent and bold. <laughs> and his face softened. And he said, do you, you really think God is gonna judge me for how I live? And I said, well, yes. And we started to talk and and the more I found out there was these things going on, um, he had just been, he told me the week before his wife and him, he'd gone to the doctor and because he discovered a, a skin cancer spot. And the doctor had said, look, well, it's kind of 50-50. We might be able to cure this, but this might be the beginning of the end for you. And he said, my wife and I were, ter were terrified. He goes, oh, that's all we can think about. And then here you are now telling me that I'm gonna stand before God. Later that afternoon, like three or four hours later, there was an accident right beside the lot where we were working. And Ivan was the first one on the scene. The teenage kid in this accident almost died. We were standing there waiting for the, the police to come. He was, Ivan was really, really quiet. And finally he looked over at me and he said, JD, do you, 
you feel like God is trying to, to speak to me, the spot, then you say what you said to me earlier, and then now this accident right here where I see this kid just about die, you feel like God is speaking to me, and I'm like, no, I think God is screaming at you. God uses spots in our lives to wake us up to him. The point of this story is not, of course, that every leper who heads out to the Jordan River is gonna find healing for their skin disease. The point is to show you that God sometimes uses suffering to open up your eyes to your need of him. Again, I'm not saying that's the case with you. Like we saw with Job and with Joseph, a lot of our suffering does not have a root cause in our lives. But sometimes God is trying to get your attention. That's why the writer of Psalm 119 says, before I was afflicted, I went astray. In other words, wait, but now I obey your word. In other words, God used affliction to bring me back to himself and now I obey, now that I've been afflicted. Maybe that's happening to you. Our first point is that God often uses our pain to bring us back to him. And Naaman shows us that all we need to do to respond to God, all that we need to, 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 to say yes, is just humility and faith. You're like, where do I start? What do I do? It's just, that's all you need, humility and faith. Isn't that the one thing that God keeps going after with Naaman? Naaman in this story keeps trying to get to the top. Let, 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 let me see the prophet. Here's an enormous amount of money. Ask me to do something hard. Yet God keeps sending Naaman to the bottom. Talk to an intern. Do something humiliating. The path to God is the path of humility. The way up is the way down. You can't get there any other way. If you are going to be saved, the one thing you absolutely need is a crushing sense of absolute need. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, it's by grace, grace, God's unmerited favor that you have been saved through faith and faith not in what you've done, faith in what Jesus has done. It's the gift of God. This healing, Naaman, has nothing to do with your might or strength. In fact, your might and strength are only getting in the way. It's not given as a reward for anything in you. It's the gift of God. You see, the cross absolutely destroys our pride. The cross declares God's verdict on our lives was death. Listen, I know a bunch of you, some of you've always lived for the report card. You always want the A, you always want the high pass, the graduated with honors, the magna cum laude, the pat on the back on the report card of life, the only report card that actually matters, all of us got a failing grade. And to receive healing from Jesus, you gotta admit that, you gotta embrace it, you gotta glory in it. So I ask again, do you have the humility to come to Jesus? Think about how much humility it took for Naaman to cross that border into Israel, a place he regarded as inferior to Syria, to admit that the healing that he sought could not be found among his own mighty Syrians, but among the despised Jews. I say that because maybe that's where some of you are. You never ever thought you would be in a place like this one right here this morning. Uh, with people like these, a bunch of born again Christians. And for some of you, we're in the same category as knuckle dragon Neanderthals. Do you have the humility and courage to question your convictions and to consider these things with an open mind? Y'all, God can save anybody. It just takes humility and faith. Faith means just believing what God says and taking a chance on it like Naaman did. You see, just as it was with Naaman, there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. Sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their guilty stain. But you gotta believe that and you gotta plunge yourself in. I got to definitely need a second point. So I love talking about this stuff. Number two, God uses your pain to bring others to him. Well, y'all, let's turn away from the pain of Naaman and let's turn toward the pain of this little girl for a minute because in a big way, she's the real hero of this story. Here's why I say that. How would you respond if the man who had murdered your friends and family and then took you captive and made you a slave in his house, how would you respond if that man got leprosy? I know what I would have said. Ha, old goon's got leprosy. Serves him right. Now I get to watch his decrepit old body fall apart and die. No, but listen to what this incredible young lady of faith says. Verse three, would that my Lord were with the prophets who was in Samaria, he could cure him of his leprosy. She seems genuinely to care about Naaman. Y'all, she seems remarkably 
to have forgiven him for all the pain that he caused her. Somehow, a little 14-year-old girl has the faith to say, you know what, I'm gonna let God be the judge and I'm gonna let him make things right. My job is to have compassion. Her cup ran over. I have to imagine, you know, that the only way that she responded like this was because she had internalized the stories and the songs of her Jewish people. This is generations after David, so she might even have known or memorized Psalm 23. Many Jews had most of the Psalter memorized. So can't you just picture this little girl lying in her bed at night, probably terrified, lonely, quoting this Psalm to herself. When we get to heaven, I really wanna give this little girl a hug because this sweet little 14-year-old girl whose name we never even know gives us one of the clearest Old Testament pictures of Jesus. I mean, think about it. She suffered through no fault of her own. In fact, her suffering was caused by name and sin, and yet she forgave the man who caused her sin, and what's more, her suffering became the means of his salvation. His healing came only because of the suffering of the one that he sinned against, right? I mean, think about it. Had she not been in this situation, Naaman would never have heard about Elisha, and so he would have died of his leprosy. So her suffering, which he caused, became the means of his salvation. In the same way, our salvation would come through a suffering servant whose suffering we caused. Like this little girl, Jesus suffered not for his own sin, but for ours. And like her, instead of hating us for causing his suffering, he forgave us and kept loving us. And his suffering became the means by which we can wash our sins away. We killed it, but surely he has borne our grief and carried our sorrows. We esteemed him smitten by God and afflicted, but in actuality, he was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities, the price, the punishment that brought us peace was laid upon him. And by his stripes, the stripes we cause, we now are healed. And so now, Lord, now indeed I find that thy power and thine alone can change this leper spots and melt the heart of stone. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Here's what that means for you, believer. Like this little girl, God uses our suffering now to bring others to him. Remember the melody line of the Bible that I mentioned earlier? The melody line is that God, through the suffering of his righteous servants, brings redemption and healing to the nations. It's what he did through Joseph. It's what he did with this little girl. Ultimately, it's what he's gonna do in Jesus, and it's what he intends to do through you. Suffering servants are at the center of God's plan. Let me say that again. Suffering servants are at the center of God's plan. Some of you are like, oh, I wanna be at the center of God's will. Are you sure? Because suffering servants are at the center of God's plan. If God's gonna put you in the center of his will, I'm guessing based on the melody of the line of the Bible that this is gonna be part of your life. Or to put it a different way, suffering is the God-ordained means by which God brings salvation to others. Listen to how the apostle Paul says it. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. Who am I suffering for, my sake? No, for your sake. And in my flesh, I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is the church. Now y'all, in one sense, that verse almost sounds blasphemous, does it not? What could possibly be lacking in Christ's afflictions? Wasn't like the last thing Jesus said before he died, it is finished. If it's finished, what could still be lacking? Well, yeah, the work of salvation is finished. Jesus said it's finished, it's done but the work of telling people about it is not. And it's like Martin Luther said, it wouldn't matter if Jesus died a thousand times if nobody ever heard about it. And God has appointed your suffering and my suffering and our sacrifices as the means by which others can hear the gospel. Some of you may have heard the story of Eric Little, or some other people say Liddell. He's a Scottish Olympic runner in the 1920s whose story inspired the movie Chariots of Fire. We remember a little for what the movie, um, what the movie depicts, how, how, how because of his religious convictions, he refused a race on Sunday, was reassigned to a race that was four times longer than the one he trained for, and he still won. It's an awesome movie. What we often skip is that after he became an Olympic gold medalist, Little went on to be a missionary in China in 1925. He worked in one of the poorest provinces in the country, and When war broke out in 1941, the British government ordered all their citizens to leave China. 
but Little stayed. Eric Little stayed because he knew that his ultimate allegiance was not to the British government or to the Chinese government, it was to Jesus. And when the Japanese army got closer to his city in 1942, he stayed to help the poor Chinese that he'd given his life to. And when in 1943, the Japanese took the city, he got sent along with all of them to an internment camp where he spent the last two years of his life. All who knew him there described him as this selfless, loving, completely focused on others guy. He led all kinds of Chinese prisoners to Christ and he, he started a church in there in that prison. Well, right toward the end of the war, 1945, the Japanese selected a random group of prisoners to be set free and they were gonna kill the rest of them. He got chosen to be set free, but he chose, he voluntarily gave up his spot so that a pregnant woman that he led to Christ could go free in his place and he was shot and died. Eric Liddell understood that it is often through our wounds that God brings healing and salvation to others. Now y'all wanna be clear, listen. I don't mean that if you're in, a, in an abusive situation like this young lady in our story was, that God wants you to stay there. If you're in a situation where you're being abused, mistreated, you got the opportunity to get out, please, by all means, take that opportunity. You are not helping anybody by staying in an abusive situation when you could get out of it. If anything, you're just empowering the abuser. I'm just saying that often what we later see is that in those moments where we felt like we couldn't control things and when we were suffering and we didn't know why, God had a good plan in that to use our suffering to point others to Jesus. So here's the question. Are you willing to take on wounds so that other people can come to know Jesus? See, maybe, maybe that's what he's doing in your pain. He's giving you a chance to put Jesus on display and you need to ask God. You need to ask God to help you shine in suffering. He is, life is squeezing you right now and you need to say, God, give me the ability to ring out Jesus. Maybe that's gonna require you forgiving somebody, a spouse, a boyfriend, a parent, a business partner. Maybe that's gonna happen through you voluntarily making a financial sacrifice. A financial sacrifice can be a kind of voluntarily imposed suffering, particularly if it's one that affects your lifestyle. Y'all listen, I, I, I'm not questioning anybody's suffering in here. Please hear me on that. But isn't there something about talking about suffering while sitting in an air-conditioned auditorium in the most developed country in the world that ought to make us ask the question, am I willing to embrace Am I really willing to embrace sacrifices to voluntarily take on wounds so that other people can hear about Jesus and experience that abundant, flourishing life? See, that's what Compassion Sunday is all about. Before we go any farther though, could we just stop for a moment? Let's just process what we've heard so far. Let's just take a moment to pray. In fact, let me just beg get you to bow your heads, okay? I just wanna ask you, has God been trying to wake you up? You ready to come back to him? Some of you, the, the prayer right now is as simple as Lord. Yes, I surrender and I come home. You're that son, that daughter coming from the far country back home to the father. I receive Jesus, your forgiveness of my sins and I'm coming home. Maybe you're a Christian who's been wandering and God is breaking you right now. How about this, where do you perceive that you might be suffering so that you can minister to others around you? You willing to tell Jesus right now, by your grace, by your grace, I'm gonna bear this faithfully. Help me, help me to be the witness in this that you called me to be. Help me not to blame or complain. Help me to trust you joyfully in this and submit to your plan. Might you say that? Father, I pray for those right now who are returning home to the Father. And I pray for those, God, that are praying for grace to be able to be a witness and a testimony and a blessing to others like this little girl was. God, I pray that in Jesus' name. Now look up here at me again, if you would. Like I said, we wanna specifically apply this to Compassion Sunday. Because Compassion Sunday is about voluntarily entering into the suffering of a child to help point them to Christ. I told you at the beginning that our entire family sponsors kids from the Dominican Republic. Last time I went, I remember going into a Compassion Project and, and meeting a little girl whose parents had died. Her uncle had been 
the next of kin, but he'd been trafficking her to the men of the village for money. Through compassion, looking at this precious little girl, praise God, she's been rescued from that situation and is now thriving physically and spiritually in a safe home, a Christian school, and a healthy church environment connected to somebody in a church here. Some would hear me. That happened because over 1,600 of you sponsor Compassion Kids in the Dominican Republic, in this church. You see, children are rarely trafficked if a caring adult knows their name and has a relationship with them, which is what a sponsorship facilitates. I spoke recently at a student camp. Sometimes I'll do that in the summer. And I was co-speaking with another former Compassion child who was fatherless, and he did not even own a pair of shoes until he was eight years old. It was his first pair of shoes at eight years old. Through Compassion, this guy that I'm now speaking with has his PhD, is a pastor, and runs his own pastor training institute in East Africa, where he trains hundreds of pastors every year. That happened because believers like you got involved in compassion. Y'all, I tell you those stories, not because they're emotionally gripping, I tell you them because they're true. And I would just ask you to consider what, what if you, hadn't been born into the, to the developed world of the United States. Your only source of income was your little, you were a peasant farmer. You loved your children, but you had no money to provide a formal education for them. You can barely afford even basic health care. So you've got constant nutritional issues, no government safety net because of all these years of corruption and crime and all this in a place where you likely are never gonna hear the gospel. What would you tell an individual who could change the future for your child if they had the power to do it? Listen, I'm not trying to make you or me the savior of other people. We, we got plenty of our own problems to deal with. Way too many to play savior to everybody else. I'm just telling you that you got a real chance to make a difference to kids around the world and we should take that chance. Before I tell you how you can sponsor a child, let me, let me show you one more story, okay? There's a young woman named Yanelli, Yen, uh, excuse me, Dr. Yanelli. She's just another example of a compassion child whose life was changed because of a sponsor, check this out. The day my mother found out she was pregnant, my father told her to end the pregnancy or he would leave her. She chose me. He was gone before I took my first breath. As a single, uneducated mother in Villa Flores, Mama struggled every day to provide for us. As a young girl, I would think about my future. Would I ever become someone? The voices of my neighborhood said, you're just a poor child. Your future is set. You will never become anything. I needed someone to change my future. I joined the Compassion Program at my church. Then, one day, I shared my dream with my sponsor. My sponsor's reply was simple. Yanelli, I love you, and I believe in you. Sometimes you can't believe in a dream until someone else believes it with you. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. 
My name is Yaneli Suero, doctor, wife, mother, and a precious daughter of God. Right now, there are millions of children all over the world who are desperate for someone to believe in their future, just like I was. On this Compassion Sunday, you can tell a child in poverty you believe in their future. Sponsor a child today. So my list of sponsoring a child in poverty, um, I mentioned earlier, it's about $38 a month. It helps provide education, spiritual formation, which breaks that cycle of poverty. I'm asking God, we are asking God to move in the hearts of the Summit Church to sponsor 2,000 Compassion children this weekend. Now, you can see at all of our different locations, there are tables that are set up that have packets like this on them. Each of those packets contains the profile of the child in need who is waiting for a sponsor. And this one is Dava. He's a kid that lives in East Indonesia. And so I'll be taking this one. Now, 2000 is a lofty goal. I know that. In fact, the most compassion has ever had from a single church in a weekend is 1900. But Summit, I know, I know we can do this. Plus the current record of 1900 is held by our friend Joby Martin and the church of 1122 in Jacksonville. So we need to put him in his place. Am I right? Okay. Just kidding. Just kidding. We're not, well, it actually is a little holy competition. All right. It's a, a competition of love. Now listen, we did this a few years ago and we had a right, right around a thousand kids sponsored in one weekend, which is amazing. But this year we believe we can double that to 2000. Now listen to this. We got a member, one member of our church who has begged to remain anonymous. And I'm gonna honor that as long as I can. He's begged to remain anonymous. He has pledged that if we can surpass our previous record of a thousand sponsorships this weekend, then he will make a $100,000 donation to Compassion specifically to help single pregnant moms and newborns in the Dominican Republic. I tell you that. I tell you that because we always say that success in ministry is figuring out where God is at work and joining him in it. Well, God is already clearly at work in this believer's heart to get the gospel and love to the least of these, and he's inviting us to join him in it. This, this is a Compassion International Child Sponsor Commitment Card. It's an opportunity to explore sponsoring a child currently living in poverty. Listen, I wanna be clear, not all of us are called to adopt or to foster, but we're all called to care for the orphan and the overlooked. What you'll do if you accept this challenge is you'll grab a card in a minute. I'm gonna actually let you get up and take one or two or three if you want, there's no like limit. You can fill out the bottom portion where the tear off is, or if you're you know, super trendy, you can scan the QR code and just fill it out using your phone. At the end of the service, your campus pastor is gonna tell you where to drop your card off. Here's what's gonna happen. I'm gonna pray, I'm gonna thank God in advance for this six digit gift that this member's given. I'm also gonna thank God for how many of you are gonna respond in this moment. And I'm gonna ask God that we crush our previous record of a thousand partnerships as well as Joby Martin's record, okay? You with me? You with me on this? After I pray, after I pray, I'm gonna call you to stand up and call you to come to one of the tables right around, just slip out of your seat like we're doing an invitation and just grab one of these packets and take it back to your seat. This will be like an altar call that a lot of times we'll do this for prayer baptism, right? But this time we're not gonna come forward because you have a need, you're gonna step out to meet the need of somebody else. Again, you're just gonna take one and then start to look at it. After I pray, say amen, just step out, grab a packet, sponsor a child, go back to your seat. Then our campus pastors will tell you what to do with it at the end of the service. You got that? So I'm gonna pray and then we'll stand us up and it's gonna be a little bit like an invitation at various places all around our, 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 our auditoriums. You can step out and take one of these, okay? Why don't you bow your heads and let's, let's pray together. Father, Father, I pray right now that you would move in the hearts of Summit Church people. I think of pastors in Indonesia, the Dominican Republic that are gonna be able to say to some little kid, hey, good news, you got a sponsor and your life's about to change. And they're gonna find Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for a chance to be involved in this. I pray, God, you said the fields are white unto harvest. Pray the Lord to send forth laborers into his harvest. God, I ask you for that. I ask you for that help right now in this moment. In Jesus' name, I pray. If you agree with that, say amen. 
Amen. Here we go. I want you to stand up. Our worship teams are going to come. Just step out if you want to and grab one of these right there on that thing. Bring it right back to your seat. And our worship teams will come and they'll lead us in a time of, of worship as we celebrate the cross. As you can see, those who are already working towards the tables to make the pledge or want to scan, want to continue, and it's, it will be open this entire time, even to the end of service. But if, you, if you're still battling with that, um, or if you just take time to process not just the word, but everything that's going on, even in, if you don't have anything in your hands, could you do me a favor all in this room? We lift your hands for a moment. And, as we are seeking what the Lord is doing and how he is working, we can all acknowledge that he is doing something within us and in this room. So as we worship his name and seek his face, this is a song, a little song I've been in my heart. Spirit of God, fall fresh on us. We need your presence, your kingdom come, your will be done here as in heaven. Spirit of God, fall fresh on us. We Let me sing that spirit, spirit of God. Fall fresh, fall fresh on us. We need your presence. We need your presence. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Here I am, here as in heaven. If you don't want to lift your hands, just touch yourselves. Say, spirit of Spirit of God, fall fresh, fall fresh yeah. on As it's we need your presence, your kingdom come, your kingdom come, your will be here as in heaven. Come on, separate that says spirit. Come on. 
we're about to go home, but sing it one more time. Worthy is worthy.
just saw, through a monthly donation, you can support a child in poverty. For those of you that are at home, it's really easy. Just text the word SUMMIT, S-U-M-M-I-T, to 83393. Now it's a little different than our usual number, so I'll say it again. It's the word SUMMIT to 83393. Once you do, it will send you a child to sponsor, just like this. And you can click on the link to complete the process. So it gave me Carla, age 12 in Mexico. I mean, I've been sponsoring a little girl in Guatemala actually for the past eight years. Her name's Allison. And I love being able to send letters back and forth and pray for her and hear how she's doing. It's the best. So go ahead and text SUMMIT to 83393 right now. We would also love to pray with you today. If you're watching live, you can click request prayer and a live host will pray with you right now. My favorite part of hosting is being able to pray with you all. So please reach out. And if you're not watching live, you can submit a prayer request on the Summit app or email us at prayer at summitchurch.com. Awesome. Summit family, have you enjoyed our series? I know it's been such a good reminder that the presence of the Good Shepherd is my life, joy, and peace. We pray you walk this week remembering that He is with you. Summit, you are sent.